All right, welcome to Monday. I had a great time in Canada. Thank you all for asking. I had um, a lot of good conversations with professors there, and I uh, feel like I gained a lot of perspective on the whole computer science education thing. Uh, the biggest one being um, nobody has any idea how to deal with chat GPT. So that's, uh, <laughs> I went to several lectures on the topic, and they were like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how this whole thing uh, pans out. Yeah, I, I brought back a ton of maple syrup, too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It looks like a flask of alcohol, too. My wife's like, why did you buy me liquor? I'm like, it's not. That's maple syrup. Canadian, 100% pure Canadian maple syrup in a little flask. Yeah. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are related to fallacies. Um, a lot of people confuse them with fallacies, but they're not fallacies. Um, you can think of uh, cognitive biases as being shortcuts in the human brain, okay? Or, uh, I don't know if shortcut's exactly the right word, but that's a good way of thinking of it. Basically, the human brain is limited. And as such, it takes shortcuts or has, like, a, one of the cognitive biases is like, um, you know, the... Uh, Magic number seven plus two. That's why phone numbers are seven digits long because we have trouble remembering more than seven numbers at a time, plus or minus two. You know, so they're not exact. Like that's not a fallacy, right? Like your your inability to memorize a twenty digit number isn't a fallacy. Like a fallacy is a bad argument that you make. A cognitive bias is sort of a um, limitation or weakness or shortcut in the human brain, and there's a lot of them, as you can see from right here. And what I would actually recommend you guys do, we're not learning <laughs> more than like five or six of these. Like there's a lot of them. Uh, what I'd recommend that you do, though, is like when you get a chance, pull up this this presentation and just pick one at random and, and learn it. And if you learn one a day, you'll have them all by the end of the year, you know. And you will understand human behavior a lot better. And... That you're like, but I'm a computer science major. I'm going to be working with computers, not with people. And <laughs> you would be a computer science major if you said that. <laughs> because uh, computer science majors are not known for our social skills. And uh, <laughs> we're kind of, you know, bottom tier um, social skill people uh, in, in general. And so... Uh, even still, you got to know how to work with people because most computer scientists, when they're doing programming, they're going to be working with other computer scientists in a team. You're usually put into teams of five if you're at a large company. If you're at a small company, you might be on a team of two and you have to learn to work with the other person. And there are quite a few computer science majors who are very confident that I would never hire. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah, you know your stuff. I am not going to hire you because I don't want to be in the same office as you for the next 20 years. And uh, if you maybe study cognitive biases, maybe you'll recognize some of those in yourself or in other people, and then you can understand them and work with them. Okay. So for example, if you understand this person engages in black and white thinking, right? You can work around it, right? Like Richard Stallman, who's uh, uh, one of the most famous people in computer science, right up there with Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Uh, he came over to my house and he, um, you know, lost a chocolate bar and, and flipped out over it because he it was a great chocolate bar and he wanted to give me a chocolate bar to thank me for letting me him stay at my house. Blah, blah, blah. We'll talk more about this on Wednesday, but, you know, that's catastrophic thinking, for example. And, uh, and, and I recognize it. I'm like, I see what he's doing. And it didn't bother me. Like, I'm like, I get, I get it. You know, I get what's happening here. And it, and it didn't bother me. But in general, the more psychology you understand, the more you understand how people work, the better off you're going to be in your relationships, in your, we don't touch crass computer science majors, exactly, yeah. Uh, the better off you'll be in your, your personal relationships with your family, with your coworkers, with your clients. And even if you like go into business for yourself as like one person, uh, you're going to still have to be dealing with customers and or clients. And if you are a jerk to them, they're not going to give you their money, you know? So, and I've had students tell me, I'm just going to be so good at computer science. People have to hire me anyway, even if I'm a jerk to people. And, and uh, he, he didn't. <laughs> this was 
<laughs> this was six years ago. He never got a job, even despite being technologically competent. So he's working for his family because they don't have a choice in the matter. So, um, yeah, in all seriousness, take your time and learn these things and it'll, it'll help you. It'll help you a lot. Bandwagon effect, right? Like, uh, everybody wants to follow the leader on things. Uh, once everybody starts jumping on the bandwagon, like all the layoffs right now in, in the tech industry is said to be a effect of, uh, everyone just following Elon's lead, right? Elon laid off most of Twitter. So other companies are like, oh, you could do that. And they started laying off lots of people too. And there, and so a lot of companies just started shedding people, you know, firing them left and right because everyone else is doing it. Is that a good reason to fire people? Probably not. Probably not. Although, you know, shareholders might force the issue. Like, well, they're doing it, you know, so you might get forced into bandwagoning. Uh, placebo effect. Uh, there is just a lot of, a lot of things. And, and the outer part here is kind of like the general summary of them. So, for example, being drawn to details that confirm our existing beliefs. Uh, for example, confirmation bias. Boom, we'll be talking about that on Wednesday. Um, we notice when something's changed, although sometimes we, we miss that. Uh, bunny visually striking things stick out more. Um, pareidolia is the... Uh, again, this isn't like a fallacy. It's just a parade is you know seeing human faces in you know places where it's not a human face right and and that's it's it's not a fallacy it's just a feature of human psychology okay so doing what other people are doing just by looking at them is probably not a good idea you're absolutely right and probably a lot of the people getting fired uh, shouldn't have been fired right you think this class is really just a psychology class that involves computers there's a certain amount of truth to that. It's also a philosophy class that disguises as a computer science class. Although we will be getting into Python programming, hopefully soon. Uh, I've been I've been wanting to to get into that, um, but uh, I just started about this in my counseling class. You're not a computer you're not a computer science major. You don't need to be. And uh, this class is not just for computer science majors. It's for people um, for. <laughs> Half the, half the people are like juniors in computer science that need their critical thinking credit. And this is critical thinking, right? And then half of it are non-majors that are like, I kind of need to learn a little bit of programming for my major. Like if you're a psych major, oftentimes you have to take like a semester of computer science. And uh, and so all this would probably be pretty uh, um, easy for you, you know, this part. So, um our brain, uh, brain has Google autofill autocomplete. Because people are beginning to use technology, we have to understand people and their needs as well as how to work with others. Because people are beginning to use technology. I would say people have been using technology for a while. You're an ag business. Yeah, yeah. But all of this, like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Christian, but like, even if you're an ag business, it seems like a good idea to understand, like, the IKEA effect. I don't know. Like, the IKEA effect is the notion that uh, when people build their own furniture, they value it higher. And so ironically, people value furniture they made themselves higher than pre-assembled furniture. Even if, you know, most people don't build their own furniture as well as like a professional would do it, right? But they still value it 60% higher. And so knowing things like that, I don't know, there might be some benefit in ag business, right? Like you have a, uh, you have one of those pick your own fruit days, right? Where people come out and they pick blueberries off the bushes and things like that. Uh, they'll value those blueberries higher than those that they bought at the store because they put effort into it. And these are the best tasting blueberries I've ever had. I don't know. So yeah, all this stuff. Like there's tons of status quo bias. We talked about that before. Okay, so uh, would cognitive biases be like natural adapting? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Can you clarify, Haley? So, um, yeah, in general, cognitive biases are shortcuts due to the limitations of the human brain. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like a lot of people um, look at some of these limitations and go, oh, look at how dumb humans are. And a lot of times it's just, it's just you know, we're, we're humans and we're not perfect. And if you just kind of understand our limitations, then you understand people better. I think they'll even more because they can tie the action to personal experience. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, natural inclinations. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of this is just natural inclinations. 
ostrich effect. You know, you try to ignore things that uh, un unpleasant truths you don't like, you tend to ignore them, right? Um, negative bias will be, yeah, that's definitely a natural inclination. We'll be talking about that today, for sure. So there's a lot of them. We're, we're covering like five. So first of all, sunk cost fallacy. And, and I do tie these into computer science. But again, if you're not a computer science major, these things happen outside of computer science as well. So the uh, sunk cost fallacy is when you're given a choice, option A, option B. And option B is just better than option A. But people choose option A. Why? Because they've invested time and money into option A already. And even though it's objectively the worst choice they can make, they will still pick it because they want to appear consistent. Consistency is one of those like really bedrock human values that a lot of people appreciate. We want to be seen as consistent. We don't want to be seen as flighty and changing our mind left and right. So if you've been working on a project, like the example here, you're 100,000 lines in, which is a lot of lines of code. You're 100,000 100, lines of code. And it's crap. It's crap. I've spent all this time doing blank. I can't quit now. Exactly. That's exactly it. And you're like, all right, it's crap, but I can fix it. It's just going to take, you know, 150 hours to fix it. And your buddy's like, dude, we can just delete the whole thing and just start over and rewrite it from scratch in 100 hours. You're like, no, no, no. We've gone this far. We need to keep going. And you pick the wrong, you pick the wrong option. Okay. And so they'll choose to keep their existing code and keep layering hack after hack of fixes on top of it because they don't want to feel like their time was wasted. Right. Yeah. But you know what? They're wasting their time, right? Like they wasted literally 50 extra hours of their life. They're never going to get back because they engage in the sunk cost fallacy. So you have to have sort of like almost the, uh, ability to like step back from a problem to be like, all right, you know, I understand that I put time and effort into this, but is it going forward going to waste time and effort and money? Right. In my own personal life, I was driving a, um, like a 98 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, not a great car. And the brakes went out and I had the brakes inspected. And there was like all this, like the brake fluid was like black, which I, I think it's usually not supposed to be. And there's like all these particles floating in it. And they're like, yeah, that's not good. I'm like, yeah, that's not good. And I ended up having to have the master cylinder replaced. Basically every component of the brakes like went out at some point or another. Like the cylinders were leaking and just everything was like bad. I'm like, all right, that was an expensive fix. Good to go. And then the engine went out. And so I put, I don't know. $1,500, $2,000 rebuilding the engine. In the same month, the transmission went out. And this car I had only bought for about $2,000. Like, it was not a great car. <laughs> this is when I was in grad school. It was not, it was not a great car. Maybe, maybe I spent more than that. Maybe I spent like, like $5,000 for the car. It, 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 either way, it was, not, it was not an expensive car. And between the master cylinder and the whole brake system and the engine, like, I'd already spent as much money as I had paid for the car, right? And then the transmission went out. In the same month that my engine went out. Like, it was not a good month for me. Like, I'm in grad school. I'm poor. I'm running these things on my credit card, right? And I decided to have the transmission fixed, even though I shouldn't have. I should have just been like, you know, I just junked the car. Like, just, you know, send it to the junkyard, pay me 500 bucks to scrap it, you know? Because at, at that point, I was paying more for the transmission than the car was worth. You know, I could have just bought another car. But I was like, all right, look, I put all this time and money into it. I can't quit now. You know, it's the same thing you hear from gamblers, right? I can't quit. Come this far. And uh, it was a dumb decision because guess what? The car kept breaking down. You know, and eventually I was just like, yeah, no, I'm getting rid of this car. <laughs> it was not like there was a reason why the dealership sold it to me. So, so cheap. Um, so I deleted all and play Minecraft. Um, so give me, uh, some examples. I'm going to pause the recording now. Give me some examples of, in your own life of, or it could be the life of one of your friends or family members of a sunk cost. Get your participation points in now. Okay. So some good examples there. Um, a great one would be, uh, Haley's, uh, paying for a movie ticket, noticing it was the wrong date 
and then going on the wrong day anyway, just because uh, they already bought uh, the ticket for it. Um, buying a used console to save money and then having to fix it up constantly. Um, finishing a meal you don't like just because you've already started it and you don't want to waste the food. Um, uh, being wrong on a math problem and constantly trying to fix it instead of just starting the math problem over. Uh, continuing calculus because you've, you're already one year in, you might as well finish calculus now, right? So, um, buying a game, realizing it sucks, and continue to play it because you bought the game. Yeah, like Overwatch, that's a great example. Uh, so for me, personally, I set a limit. I was like, when I hit level 100 in Overwatch, I'm going to quit and uninstall the game, and I did. And so, uh, you guys now know exactly how much Overwatch I played. That's how I dug myself out of that sunk cost fallacy. So sunk cost fallacy, in short, is even when it's going to be cheaper to walk away, people will stick with it because of that inherent sense of, like, consistency of, like, I've, got, I've come this far, I've invested this much, and I can't just waste all that money retrospect, re retroactively, right? And they end up wasting money and time because of it. Okay, second cognitive bias is survivorship. Uh, <laughs> progression plus four. Yeah. Um, survivorship bias is when... You're looking at statistical data, and you only look at the people who win. You don't look at the people who lose. So, for example, if you if you study the habits of CEOs, they have all these books in the self help section, right? You like if you ever go to Barnes and Noble, they have a massive self help section, and they got these books called like you know Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and um all sorts of books that will teach you the the mindset of these uh, highly uh, successful and by successful, they mean rich, right? I, I would personally define success a little bit differently. I consider success as having accomplished your goals. And, um, you know, as far as money goes, like if you have enough money to do what you want, then I don't see the point really of making more money. I mean, maybe so you can have a little bit of security or something like that, but like, you know, I, to me, like the difference between like making a hundred million a year and 200 million a year is like purely academic. Like, I, like, unless I'm going to start playing a different game than the game I'm playing right now, you know what I mean? Like you can start investing in companies and things like that. Like for my own personal life, it will make absolutely no difference, you know? So, uh, humans always want more. Not me. Like after I hit a certain amount of income, like I just stopped working. <laughs> like I'm, I'm not a very good capitalist, you know, like I ran my own business, but after a while I'm like, I got enough money now. Um, I'm good, you know, and just I'd go to the pool and relax and spend time with my family and things like that. So, um, so when you look at these self help books, they only they tend to only look at the people who made it big, like the Bill Gateses and the Steve Jobses and things like that, and they don't look at the people that failed. And this creates something called survivorship bias. Survivorship bias is when you only look at the successful people. And this creates a very false impression of what you need to do in order to become the next top CEO. So for example, uh, some of these books will say, look, all these people took really huge risks. They took a triple mortgage out on their house and uh, you know, gambled all of their family money away and, and made it big. And it's like, yeah, sure, maybe they did. But what about the people that did the same thing and failed? What are your odds actually of success if you take fantastic high stakes risks like that? And, and the odds in, in reality are not very good for you if you do that. If you take out three loans in your house to start a new restaurant, which actually happened to uh, somebody in sort of my extended network of family relations. Um, the, uh, you know, what happened was the restaurant went under. Because, like, that's what happens to most new restaurants. They go under, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And uh, and then now they then now they had not only not a business, but now they had, you know, two mortgages on their house they didn't have before. And um, but they're like, but I thought you're supposed to take risks to succeed. You know, you have to go out there and gamble. And the answer is no, usually. <laughs> if you're just ro randomly rolling dice and just hoping to succeed... That is like the worst strategy you can have in business. You need to quantify the risks. Like you need to go out there and do market research. You need to find out who your competitors are. 
How much are they charging for food? How much floor space do you have? How many tables do you have? Like if we're selling everything we can, can we get enough people in through the door and seated and cooked and fed to make enough money to pay for this whole operation? You know, if you uh, approach any business with just the idea of like, oh, I'll just take a risk and maybe it will succeed, you're probably going to fail. And so like the crazy squirrel here in town, like the owners of it, they didn't just like start a board game company because they're passionate about board games, which they are. But it's not why, like they, they sat there and they looked at, okay, there's this like dusty old place in Tower District that sells D&D games. There's uh, a couple of places in town like Bullpen and Collector's Paradise to do a little bit of magic, but their floor space is kind of limited. And so they're like, there's a need. Like they did their research. They're like there's a need for a place that has a big enough space to do um, Friday Night Magic with enough people in there to have an actual good tournament going on. And, uh, you know, this is how much it'll cost in rent. This is how much it'll cost in power. This is how much it'll cost in employees. And we're going to sell snacks to make this money. And we're going to charge this much for, you know, magic tournaments. And they, and they worked through it all. And, and they took a risk, yes. But it was a very deliberate and calculated risk. And that's what you need to do if you're going to be doing anything in business. You have to, you have to sit there and like really, you know, work out the numbers and see if it all makes sense. Not just, oh, I'm just going to take a risk and jump in because that's the wrong lesson to learn from the survivors. It's basically like the lottery, right? It's like if you only look at the winners of the lottery, you'd be like, I should play the lottery because everybody who won the lottery played the lottery. So if I want to win the lottery, I have to play the lottery. So I should buy tickets. And uh, uh, again, you're not looking at the people who failed. You, in order to do a good study, you have to look at both the people that succeeded and the people that failed. And that's why the Lottery Commission only does interviews and advertisements showing what would happen if you won the lottery. They never show the people that spend 20 bucks a year on lottery tickets, you know, and never win anything, you know. They don't, they don't show the compulsive gamblers that, you know, pour all their money into a drain, essentially. Chasing that, you know, bias there. So, I'll testify this brand new plan. I won't take into account the people who failed because they're no longer alive. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The problem with studying only people that are successful is that it gives you a false impression of what it takes to become successful. Yeah. You have to consider failure at the same time as you consider success to have the actual odds of success if you take a certain approach. So a, a famous story is the uh, pepperoni aircraft story where you've got this graph. And so in World War II, uh, they, uh, they looked at bombers coming back from Germany. They put a dot every place they found a bullet hole. And so their first uh, approach, and I don't know if the story is real or not, but whatever, it's a great story. Uh, their first pass at this is like, okay, these are the places on the plane where we're getting shot. So the Germans, these are the places where the Germans are hitting us. So we need to put armor on those places on the plane. And then a mathematician looked at it and said, hmm, because you're only looking at the planes that survived. So these are the places where a, bu a bullet can go through the plane and not take out the plane. These are the places where you can hit and survive. The places where you get hit and you die is the cockpit. Uh, if you blow off the tail, if you get hit in the engines or uh, where the engine mounts, that takes out the entire plane. And so, um, and so we need to put armor on these spots on the plane, not on these. Because clearly you can get shot there a lot and not, um, not lose the entire plane. So, um, classic, yeah. Uh, Last one. Uh, we need heavy armor where they're getting hit the most, or perhaps they get hit evenly and planes hit in the most vulnerable parts don't tend to survive. Yeah, exactly. That is survivorship bias. And uh, um, yeah, so just in general, I, I just have a lot of dubious uh, like I'm sort of dubious of a lot of these like self-help books because if the self-help books worked, then you would see lots of people just like reading seven habits of, you know, CEOs or whatever, and then becoming a CEO. I, I think there's a little bit more to it than just, you know, taking fantastic risks. We've talked about correlation as causation before. 
<laughs> it's funny. Um, I can images that you can hear, you know. So uh, we we talked about this before, but this is actually a statement that uh, you know Fannie Mae has given to Congress. You know, people who own houses make twenty thousand a year more than people who rent. Therefore, if we can get renters into houses, we will raise their income. Um, this, uh, yeah, not cool. All right. So, uh, next up, negative perception bias. Negative perception bias is the fact that we take negative feedback worse than positive feedback. And I think we've all experienced this, right? Like you're, you're just going about your day and like you're on campus and you brush past somebody, like, screw you. And you're like, whoa, you know, and then you're just like bummed. Like, you know, you're having a good day and just like that one like negative social interaction and, and your mood goes like that. Right. Uh, somebody cuts you off. They flip you off on the, on the road, you know. And uh, and it just, you know, it, it impacts us a lot more than positive feedback does. An insult sticks longer than a compliment. Yeah, exactly. Well said, Jaden. See, that was a compliment. Um, but the. Uh, and partly it's because we're sort of like trained to believe that compliments are just being polite. You know, that's part of it, right? Like you give up, you stand up, you give a presentation, your friends are like, Oh yeah, good job. Good job. Yay. You know, and you're like, okay, you're being polite, you know, like, and so partly it's that, um, you know, maybe if you like won an award or your professor's like, you were the best speech, you know, you're like, oh, okay, man, yeah, cool. But even if your professor's like, hey, that was the best speech, if one of your friends comes to you afterwards and like, hey, dude, your speech sucked. That was terrible. You're like, you know, your mood just gets dialed all the way down. So you had 30 people in that room going, yeah, you're good. And then the one person goes, no, you sucked. You know, we feel that a lot more, which is one of the reasons why I think Twitter is a terrible idea. <laughs> Because Twitter allows people, and when people are anonymous on the internet, they're way ruder and way more negative and blunt than like when you're friends with somebody, right? When you're friends with somebody, most people tend to be nice and courteous. And, and if they have to give negative feedback, they do so in a gentle way. Like, hey, you might want to work on that part where you're talking about Stalin or something, you know. Uh, it's more difficult to drown in insults. Yeah, and, and on Twitter, like you just randomly insult any person. And so, and then when you get insulted, then you insult them back and, and then they become pissed off. Like, why are you insulting me? And then it, it's just like, I, I think that's a main reason why it's a toxic cesspit. It's because, you know, negative, negative tweets impact harder, you know? And, and a lot like what we talked about is that like Facebook and Twitter and Reddit, they're competing for your attention. And that's why Facebook will like put people at the top of your feed that you don't like. If you're friends with somebody and you don't like them, it will put them at the top so that you're like, oh, look at this thing he said that was opposed to my political views. You type out, well, actually, you know, because that draws engagement. And then they're like, whoa, this person's coming at me again. You know? And then you're like, now you're in a flame war, you know, and I don't think it's good for us psychologically as humans. Like to a certain extent, maybe it is just so you develop a bit of a thick skin. You know, like I, I, I do think that if you're going to be engaging with the public at all, like you have to get used to like some negative feedback. Like, you know, I read all the student feedback, you know, in the courses and, and a lot of times the negative feedback's actually accurate. You know, like, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's a good point. You know, like, uh, two years ago, a student said, you know, Kearney talks about video games too much. I'm like, all right, that's fair. You know, because I, I do, you know, I teach game development. Um, like that's fair, you know? And so I, Made sure to give my students lots of calculus-based tests. Because <laughs> I'm not petty. Um, no, nah, I'm kidding. Um, it wasn't calculus-based. It was uh, worse. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Am I? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. So, um, so yeah. Like An example, though, from my own uh, life is... Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't uh, retaliate against students, but I did, I did actually make my next semester have more serious topics rather than doing like battleship or something like that. Um, so 
so yeah, for so for example, for my own real life though, um, I uh, I write D and D modules professionally. I get paid about five hundred bucks a year for my Dungeons and Dragons modules, and uh, it's not a lot of money, but it's also not a little money. Like I'm a reasonably successful Dungeons and Dragons author, and uh, I've been publishing them since '99. And so I, I used to run San Diego Comic Con's role playing Dungeons and Dragons role playing thing and had a hundred volunteers under me and stuff like that. And so one year, you know, I write a DD module and it comes out at Winter Fantasy. Winter Fantasy was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So I fly out to Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's a cool experience. I'm in this big ballroom, like in, in a convention center. There's like a thousand people in it. And all at once, my game starts because my game was premiering there. It was the, you know, first time this game had been run in the in the nation. And I am walking around. I'm just hearing all these DMs reading my words. It's a cool feeling. Like you have a hundred tables of people. All, you know, all the DMs reading the words that I had typed at a Starbucks, you know. Like, oh, that's cool. So I'm just kind of like walking around. Like, hey, you know, how do you like the game? Like, oh, it's a great game. Like, cool. You know, and I go to the next level. Hey, how do you like the game? Oh, I love it, man. Like, cool. And then I'm, I'm like kind of walking around. Everyone's very positive. I'm like, it's awesome. You know, it's a great feeling. And I get to this one table, I'm like, hey, how do you like the game? And this one guy named Greg Dreher is like, I don't really like it. I was like, oh, how dare you? How dare you, sir? No, I didn't say that, but I thought it, you know. And so um, that was the only negative feedback I got out of like a thousand people in the room. There's one, one negative uh, feedback from my game. And that was, of course, the one that I remembered. I even remembered the guy's name. Who hadn't, I'd never met the guy before. I just remembered his name because, uh, you know, he gave me negative feedback. And so I'm telling the story. And uh, the guy ends up moving to Los Angeles, which is where I do most of my D&D gaming. Uh, I, here in Fresno as well. But, like, I drive to L.A. to do Strategic On, which is Labor Day, Memorial Day, and President's Day. They do big gaming conventions down by the LAX airport. And I'm like, oh, it's Greg Dreher. Look at that. He's here. You know, I still remembered him, you know, 10, 10 some odd years later. And so I'm talking to my friends and uh, um, telling them the story. And they're like, oh, you should uh, you should re-release the game for 5th uh, edition D&D. And like, they're like, call them out. I'm like, no, no, let's not call them out. But let's do that and just say, you know, thanks to Greg Dreher. Let's take the high road here, you know. And, um, and that's what we did. And so I gave my buddy, JJ, who was a school psychologist here, um, I gave him my module and he rewrote it for 5th edition D&D. And uh, it sold reasonably well. It's an Electrum seller, which is not the highest, but it's not the lowest either. So about 80th percentile, something like that, of all products. Something like that. So pretty good. Top top 80%. You know? um, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good result. And... Uh, and it, it just says on it, like, this module is dedicated to Greg Dreher. And that's that's how I handled that negative perception bias. And a very classy and not not petty at all <laughs> manner. So, um, but yeah. And, and so, like, if you look at, like, evolutionary psychology, like, they'll say it's the result of humans not wanting to be excluded from a group. Because if you get evicted, if you get exiled from your tribe, you, you're likely to die. And so we, we get a lot of stress and anxiety when people say negative things towards us. And that's why having a, thank you. <laughs> that's why having like a bad boss, it's always like picking on you is so stressful. You're like, oh, man, you know, and you, and you can almost see the parallel there. Like they could fire you and then you can't eat, you know, and, that, and then you die, you know? And so like, there's definitely, you know, like negative interactions with your family. It could be very stressful for that reason. Um, from a loved one, a significant other, it could be very stressful. Uh, but like when they're just friends, like if I have a person that's like constantly negative and being critical, like I just don't spend time with them. Like that's like if you want a pro tip for life, like just cut toxic people out of your life. That's that's a good pro tip <laughs> right there. Just don't be around negative people. You know, and uh, your life gets a lot better. I'll tell you if you can, if you can. So don't let it. And, and also the other the other flip side of it is like you have to develop a bit of a thick skin. Like you have to just be able to take negative feedback. Like I said, I read all of the feedback on this class. And a lot of the times the negative feedback is actually spot on. Like it's actually like 
this point. I should, I should do better, you know? And so you have to like learn kind of to accept negative criticism, but in general, like when you, and especially when you give negative criticism, like this is something that a lot of computer science majors struggle with. They're like, but I'm telling the truth. They shouldn't get mad. I'm telling the truth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and they don't get, they don't get like why that is not a great strategy for life. Like you have to, understand human psychology like if you're going to give a negative criticism say something positive give the criticism in a gracious manner and say something positive like they don't get why just telling somebody no you're terrible you're you know like it just doesn't like it doesn't fly very well psychologically speaking you have to be negative sometimes to get them better you do you absolutely do uh and and you have to be critical sometimes but there's an art to doing it correctly okay and that's something that a lot of people don't get but I'm just telling the truth. You can't, you can't accept me at my worst. You can't, you don't deserve me at my best. You know? Okay. So uh, next up is placebo effect. And so placebo effect, uh, do we have any others yet? Uh, so placebo effect is, um, a lot of people think the placebo effect means nothing happened. Right. And so you give somebody a placebo, uh, you know, they just imagine that it's doing something or something, but the placebo effect is real okay the placebo effect is actually real the uh and this is something that a lot of people don't get it's like the reason why when we do like a, a a drug trial we give somebody we give you know we do a double like the gold standard is the blinded uh double blind randomized control trial so the people giving the drugs don't know if the drug is real or not and the reason for that is placebo effect and the people getting it don't know if it's real or not. Again, placebo effect. And then half the people are given placebos, which are sugar pills, and half of them are given the real medicine. And uh, they're told, like, hey, you know, if you uh, if you take this medicine, it's going to make your arthritis pain go down by fifty percent or something. Okay. And uh, yeah, when people take pain pills and they instantly feel better, right? Because it doesn't actually work that way. Right. We'll talk about that in a second. And so what happens is if you give somebody a pill and you tell them this is going to reduce your arthritis pain, it will actually reduce their arthritis pain. That's why we don't do a medical experiment where we give half the people the drug and half the people nothing. Think about it. The reason why we give them a sugar pill is because the placebo effect is actually so powerful, we have to account for it. We have to see that the drug actually goes, like, if your pain level, pain relief is here, the placebo effect might be up here. And so you have to make sure your medicine that you give is actually better than the amount of pain relief just from the placebo. Otherwise, you know, you might as well give somebody a sugar pill and doctors will do that sometimes. Like if they think that your, if they think that your, uh, your problem is psychosomatic uh, or can be resolved psychosomatically, uh, they can prescribe you a sugar pill. There's medical ethics and, and a lot of people don't do it anymore, but um, yeah, like, like you said, Diego, like, uh, the, they will slap like fast acting onto like, uh, Advil or something like that. This is the fast acting one. And people are like, oh, well, I want to buy the fa fast acting one. Let me tell you something. None of the, none of the painkillers are fast acting unless you're getting like a shot or like mainlining heroin or something like you're not getting fast acting painkillers. Uh, when you take Advil, it's got to go down your esophagus. It's got to go into your stomach, got to dissolve in your stomach. And then your stomach, sometimes your the sphincter at the bottom of it's closed and ain't no, nothing getting out of that. And then it opens up and a bolus goes through and the Advil goes into that. Then it goes into your small intestine, gets absorbed through your small intestine, travels into the liver for the first pass reduction of the, of the medicine, which clears a lot of it already. And then it goes in your bloodstream and it circulates around your bloodstream and eventually gets to the place where you have a cut. That doesn't take place quickly at all. There is no fast acting Advil. Okay. It takes a while for that to take place. And, uh, but they put the fast acting on there because when people think it's fast acting, they take the medication like, ah, oh, good. My headache's gone now. You know, let's get back to work. It's all, it's all placebo effect, right? Because the brain actually has the ability to suppress pain in the human body, which is wild. If you think about it, if you think about it, like your, your body can just, you know, turn off the pain. It's crazy. 
Uh, they did an experiment in the 60s where they replaced morphine with uh, water. Uh, this is before they had medical ethics and IRBs and things like that. And it turned out giving somebody, like after they'd gotten used to the morphine, you give them water, the body just produces the effect uh, for the morphine effect. They didn't notice any difference. And the reason for this is because your body is anticipating what is happening. If you've ever stopped on a stopped escalator, you have that moment of like, like, it's like you feel like you're moving for a second when the escalator is stopped. It doesn't take place on stairs. Even though a stopped escalator, as Mitch Hedberg said, is just stairs, your brain recognizes the escalator as an escalator and it anticipates. There's a certain, there's a lot of lag between, um, since it, like something happening and you're being aware of it. And so your brain will anticipate it so you don't notice any lag in real life. There's actually quite a bit of lag between hearing like this happening and being aware of it. But when you see it, like you don't notice any delay at all. Your brain is actually very good at compensating for lag. And so when you step onto a stopped escalator, like your brain is like, all right, you're moving up now. And, and then you kind of like snap back like this. You're like, okay, I didn't go anywhere. And that's because your brain was anticipating that motion, that feeling of motion on it. So, um, and the really wild thing is if you give them antagonists or agonists, I can never keep those straight. I'm not a bio major, sorry. Uh, but if you give the people that had the, uh, the morphine experiment, if you give them water and they're like, oh, I feel great from all this morphine doctor. Thank you. If you give them the, like Narcan or whatever it's called that blocks the, um, the opiate receptors, the placebo doesn't work. So there's actually a physiological response going on. It's not just in your head. There's actually a physiological response. Uh, your body produces like endocannabinoids and things like that that are actually your pain-killing chemicals. It actually generates them because it's anticipating the effect of the morphine. And if you block those from working, then, um, then the placebo doesn't actually work and they still experience the pain. It's wild. Absolutely wild to think about. If you ever get a prescription for your doctor for Obacalp, which is placebo backwards, you have been given a placebo. It probably won't work now. You're welcome. Uh, but yeah, your body, if you tell somebody like, um, you know, this is going to make you happy if you take it. This is one of the problems with uh, developing new uh, psych meds. Psych meds, there's a really, like, the psychosomatic effect is so powerful because, you know, emotions are like right there in your brain. Um you give somebody a, a med and you're like, Hey, this is going to make you happy. They take it. They're like, Oh, I feel happy. And you're like, well, it was a sugar pill. I'm like, Oh, no. why did you tell me? Just keep giving me the sugar pills. I'd have been great. <laughs> um, it's actually really hard to tease out if psych meds actually do anything when you're testing them because the psych, the placebo effect is so strong. Like you're like, oh, are you happy? Yeah, cool. Are you happy on the meds? Maybe is that st statistically significant? I don't know. Maybe not. And so it's actually really hard because the placebo effect is so strong. And so um, some fun facts, the bigger the placebo pill is, uh, the more effective it is. So if you give somebody like a horse pill, one of those big pills, um, then they experience more pain relief than if you give them a small placebo. And the color of the placebo, I think red, you know, like if you give them a red placebo, then that's even more effective than a white one. So uh, yeah. And uh, that's fascinating if you want to, you want to study that psychosomatic medicine is a real thing like it's not just like you know pseudoscience or something like psychosomatic medicine is actually a real thing and i can i can talk more about that later if you guys are interested and then the last thing i want to talk about was uh, something called risk hysteresis uh, or uh, uh what is the name of it uh the Peltzman effect, Peltzman effect i think is one of the uh, risk compensation is another name for it and uh, basically the notion is like when you give safety gear to people, they act in a more risky manner because they feel safer. And so putting things like seat belts on cars uh, causes people to drive closer to cars in front of them. Uh, if you put a helmet on a bicyclist, uh, they will bicycle more aggressively than if they know they'll die if they you know, fall. Um, skiing, martial arts is another example. If you put gloves on people, they punch harder, right? And so... Uh, whether or not it actually offsets all of the safety gains depends on the study, depends on the survey. But uh, yeah, and sometimes like they like some studies won't find any safety benefits for like putting helmets on people uh, because the increased risk behavior offsets the reduction in you know death from wearing a helmet. And um, 
spacing between cards is a great example, right? You're like you're supposed to leave three seconds, you know, one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand in front of the car in front of you. But uh, especially what I saw, like in with all this rain we've been getting, like people have been um, driving very closely to each other and getting into accidents and. Yeah, you know, presumably, you know, with all this now automatic braking systems and things like that, like, ah, yeah, I, I can, I can drive closer to people, right? My car will break, but then your car tries braking and slides on the, you know, uh, asphalt, the wet asphalt, you crash into people. So uh, one person, uh, when I studied this back in college, uh, they joked that if you wanted people to drive safer on the steering wheel, just put a giant spike there. You know, so if you get into an accident, it drives right into your heart. You know, and if you did that, then people would be like, let me uh, let me get five seconds in, in front of me instead of three. You know what I mean? And so to the to the extent which, you know, does it completely cancel out? Like for seatbelts? No. Like seatbelts have been shown to be a win overall. Um and then for helmets, there's been different studies on the matter, but there does seem to be a general consensus. Consensus, but like as you add more safety gear to things, people become more uh, risk uh, tolerant. Uh, skydiving, for example, skydiving has gone a lot safer over the years, and so skydivers now do more risky things in the air. So that's it for today. Uh, computer science turned anatomy lesson. Yeah, uh, it's not really anatomy, more pharmacology, but. Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't quote me on that. I'm not a pharmacist. All right. I don't even play one on TV. But uh, that's, I think, a, a reasonably good summary of how meds get into your system. So the uh, onset delay, it's calm. Um, onset of action. There you go. 20 minutes to an hour for oral drugs. Okay. Boom. I occasionally pay attention to things outside of my field. All right. That's it. Uh, I will see you guys on Wednesday. We'll be talking about cognitive distortions then, in which the Phantom Thieves will be making an appearance. All right. See you guys.